Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to DIM 400's lecture on radiology of the thoracic limb with focus on the joints. I'm Dr. LaRue and I'll be presenting these lectures. So for those who are interested and maybe for once you are in private practice, there's a really nice book, um, the BSAVA Manual of Canine and Feline Imaging, um, focusing on the musculoskeletal system. And this is the second edition that's very recently come out. Um, and it's a great book for those of you going into small animal pride practice. So the views of the joints of the thoracic limb are very similar to those of the long bones. The shoulder joint for the medial lateral view, the affected limb is placed on the cassette. One needs to center on the joint, collimate narrowly only to include the joint, and the opposite limb is pulled cordially to remove superimposition, and the neck and head needs to be sort of dorsiflexed to remove the thoracic um, and cervical vertebra for super, from superimposing over the scapula and over the joint. Please take a bit of time to become familiar with the anatomy of the shoulder. I'll leave the slide for a few minutes. Um, you can hit pause and just go through everything. I will just make one comment and make a note that number eight, the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula, is where the biceps tendon originates and extends downwards in the biceps groove um, towards the biceps. The shoulder joint in the skeletally immature dog has got several separate centers of ossification. These include the supraglenoid tubercle, the humeral head, and the major tubercle. It's especially important not to confuse the supraglenoid tubercle separate center of ossification with a fracture. And we'll have a, an example a little bit later on. For the cordocranial view of the shoulder, remember to tilt the thorax away from the um, limb a little bit, just to prevent superimposition of the shoulder joint with the thorax. But other than that, except for collimating strictly on the joint, there's very little difference between this and the long bone radiographs. Take some time again to review the anatomy on the slide of the craniocaudal view of the shoulder. One note I'll just mention is that number six is the rudimentary clavicle, which is seen in large breed dogs um, and most commonly seen in cats. Here's just an example of cordocranial views of a dog on the left and a cat on the right, just demonstrating how well developed the clavicle is in the cat. In this dog, compared to the previous dog, there is no clavicle present. An additional view that one can do for the shoulder joint is the skyline view. Essentially, it's almost like looking down on the cranial part of the shoulder. Its correct name is the cranioproximal to craniodistal oblique view, and it demonstrates the biceps groove. So on this radiograph, this Concavity here is the biceps groove. The structure jutting out here is the, the major tubercle of the humerus. And then this will be the minor tubercle on the other side. For this view, the dog lies in sternal recumbency and the cassette will be placed under a flexed shoulder and on top of the antibrachium. This view is a bit tricky to perform, but can actually give a lot of information of pathology of this biceps groove area. So now we'll be looking at some conditions of the shoulder joints. And on several of these slides, I've just included a normal picture of the shoulder for comparison. Shoulder luxation can be congenital or acquired. Traumatic causes are very uncommon. So congenital is the more common one we see. And the craniocaudal view is very important um, to diagnose this. Congenital shoulder luxation occurs in younger patients. There is a flattened humeral head, a shallow glenoid, and medial luxation most commonly present. So on this craniocaudal view of the shoulder in this dog, you'll see that the humeral head is not normally formed. There's no nice glenoid cavity that's formed either. 
and the um, humeral head has luxated medially. So this is a medial congenital shoulder luxation. With acquired luxations, the humeral head and glenoid are normally formed and they are congruent. For example, how it would appear um, in this image here. This is because in congenital luxation, there's abnormal weight bearing. Because the luxation is from such a young age, the animal never has a chance to bear weight normally on the joint and thus the joint doesn't form normally. So there's no nice concavity of the glenoid and the humeral head is malformed. Homarthrosis is the term we use to describe or to refer to arthrosis or DJD of the shoulder joint. The mediolateral view will give the most information with osteophytes being present on the caudal humeral head, the caudal glenoid rim, and in the biceps groove area, which will be coming down here. Sometimes joint mice may also be present, indicated by the arrow here, which is a mineralized capacity located within the joint, and we'll discuss that a little bit more later. Here's another example of a nice large osteophyte at the caudal humeral head compared to the normal image up here where there's nothing. These two images, again, just pointing out the very large osteophyte in this region. There's new bone formation here, also along the caudal glen, um, glenoid rim. All of this here, these ridges here, are in thesophytes. There's a small little mineralized opacity here, which may, might be a joint mouse, it might be a separate center of ossification. And this biceps groove area also has new bone formation here. Same thing on this image, osteophytes present here, here, and then this ridge of new bone in the biceps groove area. Joint mice are essentially fragments of calcified soft tissue or free osteochondral fragments. So it's either bone or cartilage, which is confined to the joint. If it's mineralized and becomes bony, it's visualized on the rads. But it may, might be radiolucent if, if made of cartilage. The origin is usually from diseased cartilage. And the hallmark of osteoarthrosis is cartilage damage. It can be located anywhere in the confines of the shoulder joint space. So I've put in this image here just to demonstrate how big the shoulder joint actually is and how many separate um, extensions it has, including that of the biceps tendon sheath. Now, you, this is not for you to worry about too much, but know that there are several um, extra little compartments and joint mice, for example, in the images here, can be present in any one of those compartments. So an important condition um, which affects multiple parts of the body or multiple joints is osteochondrosis. Osteochondrosis refers to the failure of normal endochondral ossification. So the cartilage at the epiphysis fails to form normal subchondral bone. This is as a result of disruption of cartilage mineralization and ossification, and thus the cartilage becomes very thick and prone to trauma. Typically, it occurs in young, fast-growing fast breeds. Male dogs are more commonly affected, and it's suspected that overnutrition might, might play a role. In cases where the cartilage is so thick and it breaks off and fissures, it's called osteochondritis desiccans where it will form a flap. On the right at the bottom here is an arthroscopic view of a very irregular thickened cartilage. Osteochondrosis and OCD also occur in the equine patients. The definition is slightly different, but it essentially is also as a result of normal, abnormal endochondral ossification. And you guys will refer to your equine notes on that. Osteochondrosis typically occurs in, um, or occurs typically in certain locations. And in the shoulder joint, this is the caudal third of the humeral head. Here we can see a saucer-shaped radiolucent region or a radiolucent subchondral defect. This is due to the thickened cartilage that has failed to mineralize. If the cartilage fissures and forms a flap, we'll call this osteochondritis desiccans or OCD. And if the 
the cartilage flap breaks off, it becomes um, it may become a joint mouse and be found in any one of the compartments of the shoulder joint, typically this cordo, um, caudal distal compartment over here. Here's another example of shoulder osteochondrosis. The caudal third of the humeral head should be a nice smooth outline. And in this case, you can see that it is flattened. Here are two more examples. On the left, there's a very large radiolucent area over the caudal humeral head with a defect. Overlying it are also two slithers of mineralized um, material. And this is consistent with a flap of cartilage that's broken off and mineralized. So this would be OCD. On the right-hand image, there's no evidence that there's a flap overlying the lesion. It's just a saucer-shaped defect in the subchondral bone, and this would be osteochondrosis. Additional diagnostics can be performed to help diagnose OCD. One of these is the arthrogram, where iodinated contrast media is injected into the shoulder joint. On the left is the normal image. It just demonstrates, again, all the different um, joint pouches that we saw previously. And it also demonstrates that in the dog, the biceps tendon sheath is continuous with the joints. So this contrast coming down on either side here is within the biceps tendon sheath. And this filling defect here is the biceps tendon itself. And you can visualize it coming from its origin on the supraglenoid. On the right, there's contrast dissecting back here in an oblique fashion here separating the subchondral bone from a, another region over here. So this would be consistent with OCD where it's formed a flap and that's why the contrast can get underneath there. What one can also see on this image is there's a faint radiolucent line along the glenoid and a faint radiolucent line here along the humeral head. And that is the cartilage that we see indirectly because the joint space is now filled with contrast. Because it's radiolucent, we won't see it on a normal radiograph. This image demonstrates a radiolucent joint mouse. In this case, we would not have seen it because it is radiolucent. Unless it mineralizes over time, we're not going to visualize it. So we use orthrography to be able to visualize it. And it's seen as a filling defect. Again, what's nice on this image is one can actually clearly see these black lines, these radiolucent lines parallel to each other, and that's the articular cartilage of the humeral head and the glenoid up here, which is highlighted because of contrast on either side of it. The shoulder joint is also amenable to ultrasound. This region over here, this curved hyperechoic structure, with the distal shadowing is the humeral head. The thin black line or the anechoic line just above it is the articular cartilage. And it conforms nicely to the subchondral bone and is nice and thin. This is a normal shoulder. In this case, the image on the left shows that there is thickening of the anechoic cartilage. So it that is typical of osteochondrosis. And then the subchondral bone deep to it, which is meant to be a curved hyperechoic line, is now irregular and sort of forms a defect into the bone. On the right-hand side, we've got a similar, um, similar appearing image with irregular subchondral bone. There is some thickened cartilage in this area. And then the arrow points out a hyperechoic structure which is consistent with a mineralized flap. So the diagnosis on the right hand image would be OCD or osteochondrosis deficit. Right, so the next condition we'll be looking at is calcific tendonitis. This is due to mineralization of the supraspinatus muscle tendon of insertion. This muscle will insert on the major tubercle cranially. So on the skyline view over here, this is the major tubercle, and it should insert in this area over here. 
This condition is most commonly found in Rottweilers and it may be asymptomatic, but when the mineralization occurs, <coughs> excuse me, occurs medially or more cordially, as an example of how I've shown with the little white circle, it can interfere with the bicep sheath in the biceps groove and that can result in bicipital tenosynovitis. So my little hand over here is outlining where the biceps tendon should be sitting. And if there are calcified bodies in this region, it will impinge, impinge and cause pain. This is a um, condition where the skyline view can be very helpful. Arthrography will be very helpful. If those mineralized bodies are impinging on the biceps tendon sheath, it'll cause compression of the contrast column, and ultrasound can also visualize this. The standard views of the elbow joints are the mediolateral and the craniocaudal or the cordocranial view. So for the mediolateral, again, the patient is placed with, placed with the affected joint downwards. You center on the medial epicondyle and the elbow joint is, is normally positioned at 115 degrees, for example, in the image at the bottom right. So there's an angle of 115 degrees between the humerus and the radius and ulna. The more flexed views, for example, in the patients on the left here, as well as in the radiograph, are also acceptable and they are most often used for the screening views for elbow dysplasia, which we will cover under that section. A foam wedge can be placed under the metacarpus um, and the carpus to just bring the um, bones more into alignment and more parallel with the set. Similar to the long bone views, the cordocranial view, the patient is in dorsal recumbency, and the craniocaudal view, the patient is in sternal recumbency. And this is what the image would look like, and it appears similar whether you do it in either direction. You won't really see a difference between the two. So here's a slide just to familiarize yourself with some elbow joint anatomy. Um, the epicondylar crests in some texts are referred to supracondylar crests, and this is also acceptable to use this term. So the medial epicondylar crest is the more boxy appearing one, whereas the lateral one is more curved. The anconius is this process over here. The medial coronoid process we find by following the proximal or the, the cranial cortex of the ulna proximally, and then it curves cranially and forms a nice sharp point. And the lateral coronoid process is the superimposed structure over the joint here that forms a little box. It's much smaller. For the craniocaudal or crotocranial view, the radial head is located laterally and the ulna and the medial coronoid process is located medially. The medial epicondyle is also much larger and pointed compared to the lateral one. In the immature dog, there are several cent separate centers of ossification present which makes evaluation of the shoulder, um, of the elbow joint quite tricky. The medial epicondyle has got its own one. The olecranon has got one. The distal humerus or the humeral condyles have got their own. The proximal radius has got one. And then the anconial process in larger dogs will be a separate center, which we'll dis um, discuss on the next slide. The difference between the mature uh, dog and the cat lies mainly in the appearance of the olecranon. In the cat, it is very boxy and square, versus in the dog, it's quite pointed. Also, the cat doesn't have a prominent medial epicondylar crest like the dog does. In this slide, um, it demonstrates how the anconius process will form from its separate center of ossification. So in the first slide, it's a very faint round structure situated over there. With time, it starts to become mineralized, it spickles. And over time, to the last image, the um, anconius is fully formed, it's sort of beak-shaped, and it's completely fused with the rest of the ulna. 
This will become very important when we discuss elbow dysplasia under that section. So just like the shoulder, the elbow joint can also go undergo luxation, also can be congenital or acquired. Acquired, again, um, is very uncommon because of the complex anatomy of the joint and the strong ligamentous support. In this image, one will note that the joint surfaces are not normally formed, so this is a case of congenital elbow luxation. The proximal radius is much more rounded, and the distal humerus and ulna, they don't, they're not congruent, and there's um, just no contact between the cartilage surfaces. This is consistent with congenital elbow luxation because the patient had this condition from a very young age and there's no normal weight bearing and normal weight bearing is necessary for the joint surfaces to develop normally. Elbow luxation can affect either the radius or ulna separately or it can affect both bones. Alright, so I've got a couple of cases for you guys to have a look through. You can hit pause and have a few minutes to look at the case and then we will discuss it on the next slide. So this is a case of traumatic elbow luxation, so acquired elbow luxation. The reason for this is twofold. One is that there are little mineralized fragments that can be visualized associated with the joint, and these are consistent with fracture fragments indicating that there was trauma. The other thing that we can say is that the um, articulation surfaces are well formed, implying that this was a normal joint before this traumatic event. On this mediolateral view of the shoulder, the flattening of the caudal humeral head and the radiolucency is quite clear, and this is typical of shoulder osteochondrosis. In these cases, it's important to x-ray the opposite joint because this condition may, may be bilateral. This case is a little bit tricky because we don't have the whole bone to look at. But the most obvious finding is this marked widened radio, um, humeroradial joint space. This is because the radius is too short, and this is consistent with premature closure of the distal radial physis. Additionally, there's this crescent shaped widening of the proximal humeral ulnar joint space, um, and in this case, it's important to radiograph the entire limb, including the carpus to make the diagnosis as well as from a surgical planning point of view. In this last case, we are demonstrating the difference between a normal secondary center of ossification of the supraglenoid tubercle versus an avulsion fragment or fracture. If you remember, an avulsion fracture occurs because there's pull by a ligament or a tendon on a piece of bone, and in this case, it's pull from the biceps tendon. And this region where the normal physis would be is much wider and jagged compared to the normal physis, which is a thin radiolucent line. If in doubt and unsure what it should look like, you can consult an anatomy textbook, or what might be easiest is just to radiograph the opposite limb of the dog and compare it. So that brings us to the end of the lectures on the thoracic limb joints.